Anna Nassoff has received a certification if beyond measure in terms of uh, a legal decision concerning his role played in the early period of the development of computers. Well, I would like to give just a bit of a background, some of the context <coughs> from which uh, uh, Dr. Adonassoff will be speaking. And one thing that one has to recognize is that the issue of computers and computing were but a small element of the creative output of Dr. Adonassoff. As a matter of fact, I had an opportunity and privilege of working under him at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory some time ago, in fact, quite some time ago, one of the most stimulating and exciting periods of my life, somewhat frustrating in the sense that there were more ideas than I could cope with, but uh, a very real experience. The process of creativity, of putting some ideas together, of examining ideas, testing, discarding, selecting, deciding how things might go, is a very intimate, a very personal process. This is one of the things that I hope the JV will be sharing with us this afternoon. Some of the background, some of the, the genesis of the work, early work in computing. JV was indeed a faculty member at Iowa State. He came here in 1925 as a graduate assistant, took his master's degree here, and in 1930 went to the University of Wisconsin uh, for his doctorate and returned to Iowa State, his area in mathematical physics. The area which is one of the most exciting areas to hear J.V. describe it of any, certainly some of the most rewarding. He served as a faculty member here for a number of years, then in 1942 left and went to the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, ultimately becoming uh, chief of the acoustics division of the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, and then leaving the Naval Ordnance Laboratory uh, after the war, or sometime after the war, and establish, uh, establishing his own business. And as a matter of fact, as a measure of the breadth and again the creativity of the man, uh, he uh, did what was necessary to learn the amount of law necessary to draw articles of incorporation for his uh, business, to establish the accounting procedures, and indeed uh, harking back to the true Renaissance man. I also had an indirect involvement with the computing uh, that uh, JV was involved in or was responsible for early on, in that when I entered the physics department as a graduate student, I was given an old unused basement uh, hallway, as JV had originally, <coughs> for my office and laboratory space, and this was cluttered with a large collection of equipment, which nobody seemed to know what it was, but it was obviously in the way, and so part of my early work was to dismantle the ABC. <laughs> With some trepidation, I confess to this, but uh, it did indeed. I saw it and felt it. <clears throat> to give some idea of the significance, perhaps, of what went on, I would like to read some excerpts from the legal decision, which was finally rendered as a consequence of a lawsuit entered into between Sperry Rand Corporation and Honeywell concerning the basic uh, patents held by Sperry Rand uh, concerning uh, computing and the ones that uh, J.V. Adonassoff played a role in in representing the fact that indeed the patents were not uh, primary, that indeed the ideas uh, predated and indeed there was interaction between the parties. So let me just read this which I think will give some idea of the, the range involved. The decision of District Judge Earl H. Larson in Minneapolis, Minnesota in October 1973 read in part. I wouldn't presume to read the, <laughs> the totality of the, of the uh, uh, decision, <clears throat> but uh, these are simply abstracts from it. Between 1937 and 1942, Adam Nassau, then a professor of physics and mathematics at Iowa State College, Ames, Iowa, developed and built an automatic electronic digital computer for solving large systems of simultaneous linear algebraic equations. In December 1939, Adam Asoff completed and reduced to practice his basic conception in the form of an operating breadboard model of a computing machine. This breadboard model machine, constructed with the assistance of a graduate student, Clifford Berry, permitted the various components of the machine to be tested under actual operating conditions. The breadboard, the breadboard model established the soundness of the basic principles of design, and Adam Asoff and Berry began the construction of a prototype or pilot model capable of solving with a high degree of accuracy 
a system of as many as 29 simultaneous equations having 29 unknowns. We're still working on those kinds of problems. By August 1940, in connection with efforts at further funding, Adonisov prepared a comprehensive manuscript which fully described the principles of his machine, including detailed design features. By the time the manuscript was prepared in August of 1940, construction of the machine destined to be termed in this litigation, the Adonisov Berry Computer, or ABC, was already far advanced. The description contained in the manuscript was adequate to enable one of ordinary skill in electronics at that time to make and use an ABC computer. The manuscript was studied by experts in the art of aids to mathematical computation who recommended its financial support. And these recommendations resulted in a grant of funds by Research Corporation for the ABC's continued construction. In December 1940, Adonisov first met Mockley. <clears throat> this is uh, John Mockley of uh, Presper Eckert, John Mockley uh, fame, who held uh, presumably the uh, basic patents, which were assigned to Sperry Rand Corporation, covering uh, the basic designs or the basic concepts of a digital computer. So the, the Mockley is that man. In December 1940, Adam Asshoff first met Mockley while attending a meeting of the American so Association for the Advancement of Science in Philadelphia and generally informed Mockley about the computing machine which was under construction at Iowa State College. Because of Mockley's expression of interest in the machine and its principles, Adam Asshoff inv invited Mockley to come to Ames, Iowa to learn more about the computer. After correspondence on the subject with Adam Asshoff, Mockley went to Ames, Iowa as a house guest of Adam Asshoff for several days where he discussed the ABC as well as other ideas of Adam Asoff's relating to the computing art. Mockley was given an opportunity to read and did read, but was not permitted to take with him a copy of the comprehensive manuscript which Adam Asoff had prepared in August of 1960. At the time of Mockley's visit, <clears throat> although the ABC was not entirely complete, its construction was sufficiently well advanced so that the principles of its operation, including detailed design features, was explained and demonstrated to Mockley. The discussions Mockley had with both Adam Asoff and Barry while at Ames were free and open, and no significant information concerning the machine's theory, design, construction, use, or operation was withheld. Prior to his visit to Ames, Iowa, Mockley has, had been broadly interested in electronic analog computing devices, but had not conceived an automatic electronic digital computer. As a result of this visit, the discussions of Mockley with Adam Asoff and Barry, the demonstrations, and the review of the manuscript Mockley derived from the ABC, the invention of the automatic electronic digital computer claimed in the ENIAC patent. The court has heard the testimony at trial of both Adam Asoff and Mockley and finds the testimony of Adam Asoff with respect to the knowledge and information derived by Mockley to be credible. And indeed, <clears throat> much of the rest of this has been included in newspaper accounts. The fact of the matter is that J.B. Adam Asoff did indeed conceive the original ideas leading to digital computing some 35 years ago, which now are the foundations for something we take for granted, we see on a day-by-day -day basis of an industry which rivals the automotive industry in terms of uh, elements of the gross national product within this country. It's amazing, isn't it, that in 35 years that something like that could happen so quickly. Well, with this, I would like to turn the meeting over to you, Dr. Adam Asoff, to share with us some of the ideas of how ideas come into being, are sorted, and develop. Thank you, Professor Stewart, for a very fine introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to see so many of you willing to come out and spend your time to listen to an ancient lecture. I. Uh, I'm going to try to give you some idea of what happened in those days. And uh, uh, you're going to have to do some extrapolation on your own. I'm not going to be able to paint the picture completely. You will have to imagine you're living in a different day uh, where a vacuum tube and a dollar meant something. <laughs> uh, the... Uh, uh, but, uh, I finished a thesis at the University of Wisconsin in 1930, got a Ph.D. degree, and, and by, the middle, by the middle of uh, the 30s, I was teaching uh, at Iowa State College. I had reached a place where I had mostly graduate students, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in uh, a variety of subjects, 
uh, and uh, the theoretical physical field was mine. And uh, as the second half of the decade came on, I was doing thesis work. I was directing thesis work in elastic plates, crystal physics, and many other problems, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, vibrating quartz crystals, and the like. Now, I'm going to tell you first, uh, to, to show you something of the motivation which uh, caused me to, uh, to develop this machine, I'm going to paint just a little bit our, uh, the, the nature of mathematical physics in those days, and uh, not too much different than the nature of mathematical physics in these days either. Uh, we're trying to solve an awful lot of problems, get some kind of uh, estimates of numerical value in a lot of different, uh, uh, different problems in uh, mathematical physics. And uh, uh, the, you know the basic theory of many of them, it's well known. And you go ahead and uh, you have a differential equation or an integral equation or some other kind of equation and you're trying to get, a, get some numerical answers. I'm going to paint this numerical, a a this numerical analysis of that day. Uh, and uh, I hope that those of you that uh, are specialists here in numerical analysis will uh, uh, tell me afterwards uh, uh, exactly how things stand today. Uh, I, I have some connection with the present practice in these fields, but I'd be glad to have further words on that. Now, uh, you know what, uh, what happened at first in partial differential equations, uh, there are a few uh, methods of solution. And one of them is separation. Separation goes just about <laughs> halfway to first base, and you're through. Uh, you have the kind of solutions of differential equations in which you have known functions for the solution. And pretty quick, the known functions run out. And then you have to use more powerful methods for advancing into this art. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the, the era. Uh, in, uh, uh, in solution of, uh, of partial differential equations, but the same applies to integral equations, and the same applies to systems of differential equations, and uh, systems of linear equations, and in fact it applies to linear operational equations. Uh, I'm uh, at the moment restricting myself to linear operations because if you, if you go into, if you go into uh, uh, nonlinear ones, why you're in much deeper water, and I'm sure that, that the people uh, people are currently floundering in the art today. Now, uh, let's talk about the, uh, you can't, you don't have the functions to solve uh, uh, a partial differential equation, but we know how to take any, uh, any, uh, 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 any function which you happen to have, uh, f of x or f of, F, just F, F of whatever variables span the domain in question, and, uh, and expand it in a series. Like that. And this is a very powerful method. And immediately gives you access to, well, I shouldn't say all functions, but it immediately gives us access to many, many functions. It, it immediately gives, from a mathematical point of view, it gives you a, a, a access to almost all functions that you're interested in. Now, uh, Sometimes in these expansions, you like to deal with cases where the fees have this property. Now, uh, there's then said the form an orthogonal set. Now, sometimes we do an expansion a little different way, and we expand it in a summation of a sub i, p sub i, where it is given two systems of functions. A, sa a system of functions p sub i, which are the ones over here, and another system of functions c sub i, which have this property. And in that case, we say the two systems are viable. Now, there is yet one more generalization of this principle that I want to call to your attention, and that is this, and it comes about in an abstract mathematical way. We're going to expand this system of functions again, and I'll just leave that one expansion there because in every case it's just the same thing, in which we have a set of functions p sub i and a set of operators f sub i, f sub j. And this set of oper operators f sub j operate on functions <coughs> in the domain of uh, operators. 
operate on uh, their, their domain is the domain of functions, and their counter domain is the domain of numbers. And in that case, we have a relationship of this kind at times. You see, when f operates on p, well, it gives you a number. The integration, if you imagine this f to contain the uh, integral expression, well, of course, if f sub j, suppose f sub j were this right here, that would be a correct expression. Likewise, in this case, f sub j would be So on. Now we're interested in this because you see the last system includes uh, such things as uh, Taylor's expansions and special cases, things of that type. It includes cases where the functionals take on other types. For instance, if this were going to be a Taylor expansion, let's say a McLaurin expansion, why well, then I'll say it this way. This is one dimension. And F sub I, F sub J, unless and that is uh, McLaurin's expansion, and Taylor's expansion equally similar. Now, the, uh, I'm going to turn aside just a little bit of argument here for the sake of completeness of one point that I want to make. Uh, in those days, we were very interested in studying the inner essence of this situation here because this situation here has some particular properties which are interesting. Yeah, useful for many practical problems. You can work in more than one dimension. All those kind of generalizations are possible. Uh, this particular situation here can be can be epitomized in the following way. Suppose we have two operators, D and I, such that the following is true. Now you mustn't confuse this D with that one, because this D is a special case of this one. Where D is a function and F is a is an operator uh, functional, then we say uh, this non-commutative arrangement here holds. If then we can, if we have this situation, we say we have the basis for a generalized Taylor expansion, a generalization of the concept of the Taylor expansion, which has many applications. Now, uh, I, I'll just outline that situation for just a moment, and then you can uh, uh, carry it from there. Now, you notice first from these relationships that pi equals zero, dc equals zero, and fc equals one. These relations are all derivable from these two non commutative arrangements here. Uh, for instance, if you want to derive this, the last one, you uh, operate on the right-hand side on the function phi, and you come up I, D, phi equals phi minus phi F phi. And since dp is equal to zero, I've already proved that. I, I'm working on the line here, and there's an unpro unfinished proof right in here, which you can easily construct. So this is zero. And we find p times 1 minus fp is equal to zero, 
where phi is a non-zero function, so f. This is all kind of f. f phi is equal to 1. Now, that is just an illustration of one part of the proof. The rest of it's right in there, and you can do it in a moment. I'm trying to hurry along. Now, these generalized Taylor expansions, one of the things we're fooling with is as source material for getting a hold of uh, expansions which are useful and practical purposes. And this particular expansion has an interesting property which is quite like the Taylor expansion. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can get this in the Taylor expansion if you, uh, oh yes, I should tell you two things first. I should define f sub n is equal to f g sub n. And uh, p sub n is equal to i to the nth b. All right. Then if you use these functions, as the base, the, these functionals and these functions as the basis for an expansion, well, then we have a generalized Taylor expansion. And this expansion is characterized uh, by uh, the following, following error formula. I think you'd be interested in this. This isn't a very well-known uh, 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 result. And I thought I'd give it just as an illustration. The expansion comes out in this way. <laughs> this is from zero, from i equals zero to i n minus one. Then the remainder after n terms of that kind takes on the following form. almost exactly uh, uh, the same as one of the results from Taylor's expansion. It's a generalization of it. I'm illustrating the fact that an expansion is determined, not by the functions in terms of which you expand alone. I, I mean to say an approximation is, is defined. Not by the functions in which you expand alone, but by the system of functionals you use in connection with them. These systems that I've outlined here are bio, are bio orthogonal, and uh, what this means is if you carry the expansion out to n terms, afterwards you carry it out to one more term, then the other term, is, I mean the first n terms are not changed when you add one more term to the expansion. I call such expansion stable. When you seriously began the solution of differential equations in terms of this kind, why, uh, uh, you have to solve such things as this. For instance, this is a linear operation equation. Linear, uh, linear operation equation. Where you use defined in the domain in question, L is a linear operator, and F is an only function. Now, you go enter into that to attempt to define an expansion which will solve that equation. Let's say we have some boundary conditions, and that at the moment, to make things simple, let us assume that the boundary conditions are homogeneous and that uh, they rep they're represented this way. Those are the boundary conditions, homogeneous boundary conditions. By this, I mean that if I take a and expand you in this way, And if each of the fees satisfies the boundary conditions, U does too, from the linear principle. Yeah. Now, this kind of approach to the problems. Pardon? Are you saying what you write? You can't see here. Are yeah. you saying what you write? <coughs> Just you say when you write, say because they cannot see it, they would like to hear it. You want to hear it as well as yeah. see it, because you can't see so far. Good. I'll be very careful about that. Uh, I have L of u equals f. The boundary conditions of v of u equals zero on the boundary. And I expand it in the form u equals the summation of a sub i, p sub i. Uh, all right. Now, we're going to enter with this into the differential equation. And we come up with this. Now, since, the, uh, since this, I said differential equation, but linear operational equation is linear. 
We can move the A's outside and the summation sign outside. We come up with that set up on our, uh, our equations, which have functions on both sides. The, uh, But that's not a new, in a numerical form suitable for analysis, and so we attempt to reduce it to one, and so we <coughs> select the system of functionals f sub j, and we apply them in turn, one, two, three, and four, so forth, for that system. And in each case, there results a linear algebraic equation, and this, uh, this linear algebraic equation derives from the fact that the uh, operational equations are linear, and uh, uh, so we have a system uh, in which the thing is transformed, which is capable of solution. Now, in this case, uh, let's, let's finish it here. We'll have as a coefficient of a sub i uh, an expression of the following form, f sub j, a sub uh, f sub j, l, C sub i. All right, that's right. So there, that is a system of linear equations, and uh, uh, i runs from however many terms you're going to use, i runs up to n, and j runs up to n. So we have n equations and none on those. And those are numerical equations, and if you have the computing ability, you can advance into this and get the solution of the original system. Now, in this case, I commence to suggest that. There isn't much, uh, the, the, you, uh, we have a, we have a, a problem. If we, there's no reason why the F sub i and the T sub i should be biorthogonal. There's no reason for that. Because if they are biorthogonal, by the time we reach this equation, that, uh, that biorthogonality is destroyed. And so we do not have, a, uh, at each day, and as we, as we go out the terms of an expansion, uh, we, 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 uh, uh, get one result from the coefficients, and if we go to n plus one terms, we get a different set. Nevertheless, with certain limitations on the f's and on the p's, which are appropriate to the problem in question, why this forms the basis for numerical analysis of the problem. Now, these methods were worked on by my students during those days, and uh, I refer you to some theses which are filed in the uh, very favorable situation here, which are filed in, the, in your library. <laughs> And uh, these uh, the, these theses outline methods of this kind, and they show you generalizations which are proper for many for the application to many other systems. Uh, I went through this analysis to paint for you the uh, attachment we had in, in, in view of the great bulk of linear operational equations, the attachment we have for uh, linear algebraic systems, and you can depict the situation in this different way if you please. That uh, uh, after all, uh, linear operational equations work, uh, work in an infinite algebra, don't they? And uh, we, it's not surprising that when you attempt to derive an approximation to them that you're in a finite algebra. Uh, an approximation to them in terms, of a, in terms of a finite number of terms, you go into finite algebra. Now, this is what was happening to my, uh, this is part of what was happening to my students. My students were working on a variety of problems, and they were using methods of this type and sometimes others. I should call to your attention that, uh, that the well-known systems for approach to this problem, I, I ought to out outline those for just a moment. Uh, the really Ritz method, the Tress method, and the Boussinet method, uh, all methods which are standard and classical in an approach to problems of this kind, and they're all special cases of analysis which I've given you. And uh, not only that, but many, many methods of mathematical physics, such as the uh, approximation theory of quantum mechanics, uh, perturbation theory of quantum mechanics, I guess is the correct term. I ought to know. I taught it long enough. But uh, the language doesn't come readily to me because it's a bit stale at the moment in spots. Uh, also, it's a special case of this method. This method can be, uh, can be used where you have no solutions that will satisfy any of the boundary conditions. Uh, in such case, you have to, you have to uh, engage in the simultaneous approximation by the functions of the boundary conditions and of the solutions of the 
uh, partial differential system or linear operational system. And uh, it can be used in eigenvalue problems. Again, we're transformed in the linear system. Well, as a result of this, my, stu my, my students became uh, very hard worked, and they were spending all of their time on, on computing machines solving linear systems. And that was, seemed, seemed as if that was a well standardized problem and that I might be able to do something about it. And I commenced to turn my attention in that direction. I uh, think that uh, at first I explored, well, at first I explored a, a, variety of, uh, a variety of different methods. One of the methods, you know, that was in very much in vogue in that time was a, was a Bush differential analyzer. And it was an analog machine. And uh, so I commenced to think about analog machines for a solution of uh, such linear algebraic systems. There exists one, and it's called a setup board, and it's known to electrical engineers. It used to be known to electrical engineers before the advent of modern com computing art. Uh, a, a, a little thinking convinced me that you weren't going to make any progress in this direction because there are essential limits to accuracy and speed. And, of course, lim major limitations and applicability. I mean to say it, 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 easy, it, it wasn't easy to readjust the system for uh, different approaches. Now, uh, I should tell you that during this period, uh, Dr. A. E. Brandt of the Statistics Department and I had collaborated on, a, uh, on an application of the IBM tabular for the, for the analysis of complex spectrum. And I have his paper here, and I'll just read you the, the uh, I mean, I have our paper here, and I'll just read you the, if I can find it. because it illustrated the relationship between the computing machines of the day and the people that worked them. Uh, I decided that we could make progress on that problem if we used an IBM tabulator. And uh, I couldn't use the tabulator in its raw form. I had no way of programming it into such a problem. And so I decided to uh, uh, perform some alterations. Uh, many years later, <laughs> uh, Honeywell, in this uh, lawsuit that has been so ably described, by the professor here, uh, uh, asked uh, IBM to dig up all the papers which contain the name of J.B. Adonassoff, and they commenced to get a weird set of papers. And these weird set of papers were, um, uh, they couldn't understand them at all, and finally I, and I was called in and I commenced to explain them to them. But they were all a set of internal papers in IBM Corporation about uh, me altering the nature of the IBM tabulator. <laughs> uh, I really didn't alter the internal structure of the IBM tabulator at all. What I did was to build an additional piece of apparatus that you could set side of it, plug into it, and then start the thing to working and, and it would do the job at hand. Uh, they would give me a speck of information on IBM tabulator. I didn't learn anything that way. Uh, I just guessed how an, I, how an IBM tabulator would work if I built one and I said it must work that way and it did. <laughs> Well, the, this paper was very successful, so when I came against this problem, I commenced thinking about an IBM tabulator and how I could make it do the work. Uh, it just didn't have the capacity. Uh, even an 80-column, at that time we had 80-column tabulators, and they, they just didn't have the capacity. I, I, I had uh, around the house uh, such things as uh, Monroe's. And I commenced to conjure up, I could see the linear, linear operations, linear uh, uh, matrix analysis, whatever you want to call it, could, uh, would be successful in terms of, linear, of, a, of an array of, of a Monroe's. And I thought of taking uh, 40 or 50 Monroe's and connecting them all up mechanically. <laughs> and uh, 
were for desperate <laughs> and rapidly getting worse. And uh, I finally had to give up for some reasons which perhaps will occur to you. <laughs> uh, so I finally turned sadly and despondently against construction of an AEL of a new computer. And uh, of course, I knew how the conventional computers work. I'd learned that a long time ago by reading encyclopedias and so forth. I didn't have Babbage's book at hand that happened in those years. And uh, I was thinking about mechanical means. And you know how they work. And, and they work according to pretty simple, pro simple principles. Uh, uh, you know you have here a wheel, if it's a mechanical one, and a lot of teeth, and they ratchet the wheel around, and a, a, a number amount they ratchet the wheel around. You, 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 I can't even see Professor Stewart here understanding what I'm talking about. He's so far away from it. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 uh, you know, uh, so I had ratcheting process in my mind, didn't I? And then I commenced to think about possibility of using other bases than 10 in this, in this matter, particularly if I had to go into uh, uh, very strangely different uh, memories or counters. And I made some calculations as the speed. At first, I thought I would, that the work would be greatly enhanced by the use of uh, by the use of um, larger bases. And then I found out that I did a, a mathematical analysis of this, according to some crude principles which I hypothecated. And it turned out that uh, the proper base to use is E. And E didn't look like a very good <laughs> number for the base of a number system. So I, I, I decided to try two or three, and I found out they had equal advantage under those hypotheses, and so I chose two. And uh, in this way, I came to, I, kn I knew all about base two number systems. Uh, I learned it when I was a little boy from a, from a arithmetic book that my mother had. You know, they used to, arithmetic used to treat subjects like this a long time ago, well, you know, Eighth, eighth grades and all the ramifications therein had to be a liberal education. And uh, so you'd find an arithmetic that treated not only the elementary arithmetic, but the many advanced aspects of arithmetic. And this particular author, and I wish I could tell you his name, would certainly had put in um, other bases in 10, and I'd read it. And so I knew all about other bases. And uh, I, I might tell you that at this stage, I was well advanced in, in electronic art. I'd, I'd, I'd taken electrical engineering. Uh, as an undergraduate, and uh, I hadn't learned a bit of, about electronics there, but I had just trained myself in electronics. In interim, now you see, I graduated in 25 without a bit of electronics, but in interim between 25 and, let's say, 35 or 37 of the period we have in mind, uh, why I had uh, trained myself in electronics. And I, uh, during this period, during the last half of the 30s, well, I had uh, postgraduate students doing research in, in problems, uh, experimental research in problems that required electronic uh, ability. Now, uh, so I was thinking in terms of electronic possibilities for this, uh, for this uh, uh, computing machine. And then I'd switch back to mechanical. And then I'd have fears about the electron electronic that I couldn't get the electronic to be exact enough and that it would give errors, and it still sometimes does. Uh, I uh, 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 rented through the various base, the various uh, kinds of things that could be used as counters or memory. Uh, uh, one of them, one of the things that I went through was uh, uh, little snappers, where a little lever would snap from one side to the other. But an immediate candidate that was well known to me, and uh, probably represents the first time that uh, anyone had thought along these lines, was the use of magnetic materials. Uh, so you'd have two ch two charges, this charge or that. I mean, two sets of magnetization, this one or that one, 
And those would be the two states that were necessary for the base two system. And then I thought of using electrical condensers. And electrical condensers looked very good because the levels at which the voltage could be taken from the condensers was appropriate for anything else I'd want to do with it. I had in mind to use vacuum tubes in this connection. And I, I thought I knew how to build a vacuum tube ratchet. I'm thinking about the old-fashioned kind of computer machines with ratchets built in. And uh, uh, well, uh, we had ourselves, and I had myself an awful muddle of all this stuff. And then uh, we came to a time in the winter of 1937, or the I mean the fall of 1937 or the winter of 1938, when I went over to my office in 52 Physics. I imagine there's somebody here that has that office today. Uh, uh, well, before me, there's a very good man in that office. <laughs> they, uh, uh, and I intended to work on this whole uh, complication. I've been working for months in all these various assemblies, and uh, I was very un I, I, I couldn't get to work, and I was very unhappy, and I did something that I did a I did perhaps four times in those days, and I got in my car and started driving at a high rate of speed, and I started east, and uh, I drove so fast that I couldn't worry about my problems, and thus by some kind of substitution psychology attempting to allay my feelings. And uh, when I came to, I was crossing the Mississippi River. <laughs> I don't mean I was unconscious during that time, but I was unaware of my surround and just doing, going through the mechanics of driving the car. And uh, I saw some lights ahead and I explored them and I went up to, the, well, uh, it was a tavern and I went up to the tavern and I went in got a drink, and the moment I sat down, I knew this was the time. I was feeling quiet and clear, and I immediately started to work on this material. And before I left the tavern, I'm abbreviating as much as I can, uh, I knew some things about computer machines that I didn't know before. I knew that I could build a machine with condensers if I didn't let the condensers wander around by themselves and leak off, but if I made them jog their memory, or we'll say, if I built in an, uh, re what we call today a regenerative memory, I didn't use those terms in that day, and I knew the machine, since it was going to be electronic in character, could have serial calculation without uh, undue cost. I decided it would use a base two number system, so it made it very simple in connection with using condensers. The condensers would come right out of workable levels to go into the vacuum tubes, and out of the vacuum tubes would come workable levels to go into the go into the uh, uh, condensers. And I made one more uh, conception that evening, and that is I conceived of the idea of logic circuits. I didn't know how to build them one, but I said to myself, I'm going to give up ratcheting, and I'm going to move into a new era in computation which employs logic. Now, I don't know whether there isn't some sub-logic in which, uh, or super-logic perhaps I should say, in which these two concepts don't join. But I had separated computation into those computers which ratchet, which employs, uh, which uh, covers most of the mechanical type, and another kind which uses a logic system for depicting the final results. Uh, I, I, I didn't know how to build it, but late at night I got in my car and drove slowly home. Now, during the next year, or oh, few months, I, uh, I, I developed that logic system, and uh, uh, I felt pretty sure it worked most of the time. I wasn't sure about the stability. We didn't have uh, voltage control circuits easily in, uh, in, in a workable form. Uh, all electronics was extremely costly, and uh, the, uh, the it had to be in terms of vacuum tubes. There were no transistors. I, I would I always wish for something as small as a grain of wheat, uh, which would do the same thing as a vacuum tube. I, I, I should tell you, perhaps I should tell you that I that I had uh, 
that I had uh, a reason for believing in transistors at that time. And it, and it came back from many years before. Uh, you know, uh, way back early in the early in the radio arc, somebody made a crystal oscillate. And since a crystal could be made to oscillate, I knew that there existed there an amplifier. It just had to be there. Couldn't have oscillated without that amplification. And hence, I knew that there existed something besides vacuum tubes which would operate at these frequencies. That was very high frequency oscillation is obtained from a crystal, I believe, of galena, uh, suitably uh, biased. Very hard to do, hard to repeat, but the reports were coming in and they were very, very definite. Uh, well, uh, in, in, in 1939, I raised a little money and hired a man by the name of Clifford Berry from electrical engineering. And uh, I didn't have enough money to give him employment during the summer. So he worked somewhere else during the summer and came to me in the fall of 1939. And we went to work on this machine. And uh, he and I were both plagued by the possibility of making, a, uh, of making an electronic arc really compute. So we started in at once to, form a, to, to create a prototype uh, which wouldn't do anything else but just prove that electronic computation would work. And by a month, which is argued about in court a great deal, and uh, I think was uh, September to November of 39, we had this prototype working, and the thing worked stably. It just worked and worked perfectly. We had, you know, fan in and fan out. We had those, under control, those concepts under control in our logic circuit system. And we didn't call them fan in and fan out either. And uh, we, uh, we had chosen values of those which made uh, the stability uh, that was required not too severe. And we had no difficulty in making the system work. And we immediately started to work on a larger machine. Uh, let's have the slides now. I can move it? Yes, you can move them yourself. All right, fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, just let me see. Once more. Next slide. Move it forward. Forward. They're coming someplace. Can you... That, depending upon a ratcheting device that doesn't. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
a list of those. Uh, 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 yeah. This was taken from a book that we wrote in, uh, in uh, August of 1940, and which is described in the legal opinion uh, that was read uh, to you uh, uh, before I began to speak. And uh, these are uh, the problems that are enumerated in that book. I just took the list out. Uh, the problems in uh, 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 that era in uh, uh, mathematical physics that are linear in character. Next slide, please. <laughs> yes. Now, this is an artist's conception for legal purposes of the... Uh, of the, of the uh, what I call a prototype. It was that machine which was designed just to see if, if you could make uh, electronics do the same thing as mechanical devices, that is, compute. Now, here is the rotating memory, uh, a series of condensers there. Here are the brushes which uh, uh, connect with them. There are two sets of brushes, one on the near side and one on the far side. There are two sets of condensers. And these represent, these represent the two uh, memories which are caused to interact. Uh, here's the logic element. I hope I get the right one. This one, right? Here's the logic element. And uh, that causes, well, uh, upon other impulses, it causes these to be added or subtracted. Here is the uh, circuit which is used for regeneration so that the uh, condensers on the system do not become discharged with time and they're regenerative memories even today. Uh, I think that's enough of that. But it just shows you what a crude piece of apparatus that was and why we could build a computer machine in two or three months. Next. There are, uh, there are some, uh, there's a general uh, circuit arrangement. Now, up here, these tubes here have to do with uh, regeneration. And here is the, what, what we called in those days, this is taken from the original drawings, add subtract mechanism, which is our words for logic circuit. And uh, uh, there is an error in this drawing. Which has been there all the time. And of course, it's right up in this corner. And I think you'll find that tube right there doesn't have any plates on top. Next slide. <laughs> I will try to straighten it out. I'll, I'll, that, is a, that is a diagram of the first logic circuit. Uh, that add subtract mechanism, as we call it in that day. Uh, and that, this is substantially the device, or similar to the device, that I developed during those months uh, before we began work on the machine. Next slide. Now here is a, a picture of the uh, logic operation in terms of vacuum tubes. And this is taken from the original picture on the machine. And uh, these tubes here, where we had required quite a few trials with our minimum fan. And, uh, Quite a few trials. We required 14 trials for base two adder and subtractor, and uh, required 13 trials, I believe, is the correct answer. Those uh, we we switched tubes two or three times there, but those tubes at the end came out to be six C eight Gs. If anybody wants to make a note of it, I think not. Next slide. There is some of internal logic of the uh, of the uh, logic system. Uh, you, you, uh, the, the letters point to points on the diagram, and uh, uh, it tells you how the various operations of, uh, of uh, base two numbers were conducted. Next slide. Now this is, a, a, is the uh, memory drum, and the only part of the machine which still persists is one of these memory drums. Uh, it's down there in a window in the computer science building. Uh, next slide. There is a picture of the machine which is called Adonassus Folly because they said Adonassus built a big square box of angle iron and he didn't know what he's going to put in it, <laughs> <laughs> which is absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> and the amazing thing about it is, you know, I think that man is preserved by some inner reasoning which he doesn't really understand uh, because when I, we finally got through, the thing was just, as you will see, was just evenly filled. Next slide. This, I, I perhaps, hold that a second. I should perhaps tell you that, of course, in this machine, we're using a mechanical clock. Uh, the clocking is done mechanically. 
not by an oscillating electrical circuit, but mechanically. And uh, the switching is done mechanically, but the computing cycles are all done electronically. And as far as I'm sure this is the first machine to ever contemplate an operation of that kind. Next slide. About the same thing. I just might point out here that, well, <laughs> up here is one of the is one of the elements, and you see there are places there to plug in all the various logic elements. Next slide. Uh, there's another picture showing the logic elements behind and the two memory drums here in position uh, for mechanical timing. Next slide. This is a view. We, in order to get data into the machine, uh, we had to build all the interface equipment and everything else that we had. And of course, that's all, all men immense amounts of labor. And you use what you had as much as you could. And I thought I was on good enough terms so I would dare use an IBM card in the machine. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this is the view underneath the reader for the IBM cards, which I constructed. Shows the leads coming off of that device. Next slide.